All right. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon to hear more about the work of Issa Gergeren. My name is Dakota Mace, and I am a Diné artist, as well as the guest curator for Reclaiming Identity that is currently up at the Trout Museum of Art in Appleton, Wisconsin. It was an honor to not only curate this show, but it's also featuring so many amazing artists from across North America. So before we begin, I would like to share some information about the current exhibition, exhibition featuring Issa's work right now. So Reclaiming Identity features 25 renowned indigenous artists from across the US and Mexico and tell stories of identity and share what it means to take control and preserve their culture. Through the themes of borders, family lineage, shared histories, colonization and assimilation, the artists respond to the complexity of blood quantum in their artwork and demonstrate how they are reclaiming their own indigenous cultures. Blood quantum is a method of measurement used to determine indigenous identity by percentage or affiliation to a tribe implemented by the US federal government in the 1900s. This exhibition is open until January 8th, 2023, and I hope that many of you are able to visit in person to see the many wonderful works of art. As a curator for the exhibition, it is an honor to introduce Isa. Isa is a visual artist raised in Oahu, Hawaii and based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, whose work fo focuses on the site responsive installation and mixed media works on paper. In her works on paper, Gagarin uses textured surfaces and collage shape to create compositions that allude to natural forms such as dappled lights, oceanic waves, tidal movements, and the moon. Her installations explore similar themes or responding to the unique characteristics of light and architecture on site, generating questions about the legacies that informs one's orientation to the environment. Gagarin's work raises these questions in re relation to her experience of being raised in Hawaii with ancestral lineages in Guam and the Philippines, and her interest in the contemporary resurgence of indigenous ocean navigation practices throughout Micronesia and Polynesia. She received an MFA in painting and printmaking from Virginia Commonwealth University in 2018 and earned her BFA in painting from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design in 2008. Lastly, I would like to let everyone know that you can submit questions in the chat and we will answer as many as we can at the end of Issa's talk. Thank you again to the Trout Museum of Art and their staff for organizing this event and I'm happy to hand this over to Isa. Thank you, Dakota, <clears throat> for introducing me and hello everyone. Um, I want to extend thanks to you, Dakota, for inviting me to participate in this show um, alongside the other artists who I am very inspired by. I'm inspired by your work too, Dakota. Um, and I also wanna thank Anne Weave and the Trout Museum for their support of my work in this show. Um, and friends who are here, who I see, um, who have joined us, including Fidencio, Jeannie, uh, Kristen, and Monica, thank you for, um, thank you for being here. And thank you to Israel, who's um, also sharing uh, work tomorrow in a, in a second artist talk in the series. Lastly, I just wanna thank some of my own teachers, um, including Holly Morrison and my Chamorro language teacher, Michael Lujan Vavacqua, <clears throat> and someone who encouraged me when I was young, who was um, Anthony Lee, my high school art teacher. Um, just want to extend thanks to them. The first image that I wanted to share with all of you um, is a piece that is in the exhibition, um, Ocean's Belly Button. Um, and let me go back actually to a full image of the piece. Um, when Dakota invited me to give this artist talk, um, I thought of it as an invitation to think about this idea of reclaiming identity. Um, and how it relates to my work. And something feels uncomfortable to me about this because as an artist giving a lecture in this context, um, for me, it almost sets up this expectation that I am an expert in 
the subject or themes that I'm sharing in my talk. Um, and I don't feel like I'm an expert in reclaiming identity um, as it relates to my work. Um, I think that themes of identity are woven into my work um, in the substrate of my work, but they're not the the idea of identity is not the primary subject of my work, if that makes sense. But the more I thought about this idea, um, I became excited about potentially exploring this theme in my work. Um, and what I like about the title um, of the exhibition, Reclaiming Identity, is that um, it's present tense and suggests something that's occurring now. And that realization really gave me some grace um, and some openness to think about the process of reclaiming something, um, something that is fragmented, um, emergent, um, in process, and even nonlinear. Um, and that gave me some space to kind of talk about the vulnerability in that process of reclaiming something, uh, which to me suggests that something was lost. Um, so for me in my own work, um, and not just my work, but on a personal level, you know, what am I reclaiming in my own identity that has been lost? And for me, that is the Chamorro language, um, which is my maternal ancestral language. Um, Chamorro is indigenous to Guam and other islands in the Mariana Archipelago in the Western region of the Pacific Ocean. Um, Guam is a really tiny island in the vast Pacific. And I inherited the Chamorro language through my grandmother who uh, uh, speaks fluent Chamorro along with her siblings. And Chamorro is a really vulnerable language um, because the US military banned the use of the language in 1917. Um, and after World War II, many families on Guam stopped teaching the language to their children. And it wasn't until the mid 1970s that the language ban was lifted. And so that's why it's a vulnerable language because my mom's generation was not taught it. And so for people such as myself, I'm having to learn it from scratch as an adult. Um, this is a view of my piece in the exhibition, and I have to give huge thanks to my friend Margaret Montgomery, who um, was in Wisconsin during the opening of the show and attended the exhibition and shared these photos with me. Um, I wasn't able to be at the exhibition in person, sadly, because um, of caring for my son, Ray, who's now nine months old and preparing to teach at the University of Minnesota. So I'm really grateful that she sent me this image of the piece in the exhibition in the space. Um, so returning back to Chamorro language, in 2020, um, when there were shutdowns and quarantine, um, just by chance through social media, I stumbled on the opportunity to take a Chamorro language class for free on Zoom. Um, this class is taught by Michael Lujan Bavacqua, who um, uh, works at the Guam Museum in Guam. And um, he actually had been formally teaching this language class at a coffee shop in Guam um, for a smaller group of people. But when the shutdowns happened because of COVID, he started teaching the classes on Zoom and all of a sudden word got out. And people such as myself in the States and other areas of the world joined this class. And um, it was hugely popular that year and still is. Um, and I'm still attending classes online. And that was the beginning of something new for me, uh, of a new personal journey of reclaiming this language um, that connected me to my maternal sense of lineage um, and pride, and also to a broader network of Chamorro people um, in Guam and throughout the diaspora. 
So thank you for being patient in me describing that process. And I want to turn now to the piece that I'm sharing with you, um, Ocean's Belly Button. So earlier I talked about the idea of reclaiming something as a process that is fragmented. And that sense of fragmentation was something that I wanted to convey in this piece. So I wanted to create something that appeared whole and yet broken, um, you know, kind of cohesive with a sense of flow, but also with um, kind of interruptions or fragmentation. And this is a piece that I made of newsprint, which I gessoed and painted with um, primarily milk paint, which is earth pigments mixed with casein from milk um, and also acrylic paint. Um, and then after I've painted several sheets of paper or like a vast quantity of materials, I then cut them and collage them into, into one uh, whole piece, if that makes sense. Um, and that feeling of fragmentation was really something that I wanted to convey in this piece. So what I'll do next is share a kind of cycle of my work um, as it evolved from grad school to where I am now. Um, and I want to present it in a way that feels cyclical rather than a kind of linear progression, um, because I think my work kind of functions in seasons and cycles, and I return to certain ideas or certain materials um, after drifting away from them. And um, I don't see my work as progressing and becoming smarter. I think if anything, it, it when I make more work, it brings up more questions for me to ask. Um, but my background is in painting, so I studied painting um, for both my BFA at MCAD in Minneapolis and my MFA at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, and so my practice is really steeped in the visual language of color, form, shapes, um, texture, uh, surface qualities, materials. Um, so painting is really my background and um, I work primarily in abstraction, um, but I never really quite felt comfortable um, with painting as a four-sided object. Like there was something about that shape of a rectangle that always felt really limiting to me or contained. Um, and so when I was in grad school, I made this piece, um, which was my first exploration of newsprint as a material. Um, and what I did was I uh, spritzed tissue paper with water and glued it onto newsprint and made this very large piece, which was um, way too big for my studio. Um, so I had to crumple it and fold it as I was working on it, but I wrinkled the paper over and over again until it developed this really soft fabric-like texture. Um, and this piece, it was one of those works that really freed me creatively. Um, it gave me freedom to explore something sculptural, but um, sort of beyond a painting object. And um, Later on, after I displayed the work, it, I brought it back to my studio and it was so large that it basically covered the entire wall of one of my, uh, one of the walls in my studio. And so it actually transformed my studio into a space that had a really, you know, uh, vibrant quality, um, kind of musical quality of movement of these shapes, which were draped and, and patterned. Um, this is me sharing an experimental artist book that I had created that was the size of a table with my mentors. Um, and so this piece really took me on this path somewhere beyond painting um, and into space. And um, this is when I started to think about site-specific installation. Um, and uh, sometimes I use site-specific installation because it's um, 
a conventional or like a recognizable term within fine arts, but um, I think I prefer the, the term site responsive installation because it describes um, what I do with my work in the space, which is responding um, to something particular about the environment that my work is in. Um, and so I was making these large textured paintings. And when I created this exhibition as part of my MFA candidacy um, uh, show for my first year of grad school, um, I was shocked that my work was transformed when it moved from my studio, which was a really white, super brightly lit space to this space, um, which my cohort and I were tasked with finding an alternative venue to exhibit our work in. So we convinced um, the owner of this building to let us use this sort of um, unfinished space, which was between renters um, to exhibit our work in. So it was a rough um, space that was unfinished. Um, <clears throat> and because the textures of the walls were um, really uh, corroded and there was a lot of brown in the space, which was different than my white studio. Um, and the light also was not as bright. There are large windows, but the the way that the direction that the windows were facing, there wasn't a ton of bright light. And so I was really shocked when I, I installed my work in this space because the environment transformed the feeling of my work. It transformed the scale of my work. Pieces that felt big in my studio all of a sudden felt really small in this really large space. Um, the colors looked different because of the, the, the dominant brown and, and sort of uh, textured walls of the space. And this had a huge impact on my thinking because I realized that I could no longer create work uh, sort of in isolation in my studio and simply transport it from one place to another, um, that I had to be more in dialogue with the space and recognize that the, the same things that I was thinking about in my work, color, shape, texture, also had to be considered in the environment, the color of the environment, the shape of the environment, the texture of the environment, and that my work could be in dialogue with that. And I might just pause, um, Dakota, are there any questions in the chat that you want me to answer before I move on to the next section? Oh, no, you can keep going, Isa. We'll answer all the questions at the end. At the end, okay. Um, <clears throat> so what I'll show you next are um, the next site responsive works that I created after graduate school. Um, uh, after I was done at VCU, I moved back to Minneapolis where I have lived since 2004, um, which is almost 20 years, which is really surprising to me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I applied for an opportunity at a gallery called the Quarter Gallery at the University of Minnesota, which is where I teach now. Um, and this was an installation titled Intervals. Um, when I applied for this opportunity, I visited the gallery um, knowing that I wanted to create a site responsive installation. I was done with school and ready to move in this direction. And I almost didn't apply for this opportunity because the space was very challenging in my view. Um, you know, if you look at this room, the first thing I noticed was how visually noisy the ceiling is. There's a lot of complicated textures and shapes. And, um, and then the other thing that kind of like bugged me about the space was that the walls were non discontinuous. Um, so bro broken up by concrete columns, alcoves, doors, light switches, fire alarm <clears throat> details. There, it was like broken up by all these um, 
uh, sort of interruptions in the architecture. Um, but I challenged myself to kind of sit with the space and see if it spoke to me in some way. And I decided to embrace those characteristics of the space and not only embrace them, but kind of highlight them or draw the viewer's attention to them. So this piece is about 60 feet long. It was a two person show. So on the other half of the gallery, there was another artist's sculptures. Um, and what I did is um, before the installation started, like installing the work, um, I painted like over 60 feet of fabric with this variegated textures of um, blue and gray um, and green. And then when I got to this space, I essentially um, composed the piece on site um, and cut out the shapes on site and installed them. So the creative process of determining the composition of this piece um, happened while I was installing the project because it was really important to me to um, rather than being separate from the space and preconceiving or planning the piece, I wanted to be in the space itself so that that activity of responsiveness was really alive. Um, and so anywhere there was like a concrete column, I repeated that shape just to say, this is something important that I want you to pay attention to. So you can see these two rectangles on either side of this column. And I used a lot of vertical lines throughout the artwork um, to uh, punctuate or highlight or draw the attention to that verticality and that sort of rectangle geometry that I was paying attention to. And then I wanted to introduce something new that was different, that contrasted or that was juxtaposed with the space. Um, so that took the form of a curve. You know, I was in the space and I realized, oh, there's no like flow in this space. It's very uh, uh, vertical. There's a lot of lines. There's a lot of interruptions. So I'm going to introduce something curved. So I, I, I created this long elongated curve shape. And I couldn't help but think of waves in the ocean when I created this piece. Um, there was something about the scale of this curve that really reminded me of growing up surfing with my family. And there's this feeling that's really hard to describe, but uh, sometimes when you're surfing and the water is, the ocean is really still, it's almost like you can feel the, uh, they refer to like, uh, sets of waves as like a set, you can almost feel a set of waves before you see them coming in from the horizon. I don't know how to describe it. It's just like a sensation. Um, and something about the scale of this curve really reminded me of waves in the ocean. Um, and so, you know, I had moved from abstract painting to site responsive installation. And then all of a sudden, like, there's something about the feeling of the landscape and specifically the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, that started to creep into my practice and or not creep into it, but it was like something that I started to notice in my work, that there were elements of my life experience of space and environment and landscape growing up that was kind of emerging in my work. I don't have a detailed image of this, but there was a little temp thermostat <laughs> on the wall. I had to hand cut a little hole in my fabric so that it could go around that thermostat. It's kind of a funny moment in that installation. Just checking timing so that I don't go over time. Um, so the next piece that I'll share with you, um, I think I'll just share a more brief description of this, but um, I was invited to create a installation in the basement level of an artist-run gallery in Minneapolis called Hair and Nails that's run by Ryan Fontaine and Kristen Van Loon, um, who are kind of beloved in the artist community, if you know them. Um, and uh, it's a really tiny gallery. It's got a first floor and a basement gallery. Um, and this is a sketch that I made when I was studying the space. Um, this is a viewpoint or a vantage point from the bottom of the stairs. 
looking up the stairs towards the first floor and then looking to the left sort of into the gallery space. And um, when I created this piece, um, the main idea that I was thinking about was the experience of someone walking from ground level uh, underground and going into a subterranean space. And something about the ceiling in this um, basement gallery, which had like wooden beams and um, uh, was kind of noisy, visually noisy, similar to how I described the ceiling of that quarter gallery space at the U. There's a lot of like um, pipes for water heating or electricity wires, um, kind of random stuff in the ceiling. And I thought of this idea of like, what if someone goes underground, but then they look up and they're looking up, but they're not looking up at the sky. They're like looking up from an underground kind of context. And this is one of those projects that was impossible to document. And in retrospect, I really wish that I had created um, a durational documentation, like a video of the installation, because there are aspects of it that get kind of lost in translation in the photos of the space. Um, so if I can kind of describe this to you, the experience. So the viewer walks down a flight of stairs into a completely black room. The floor is painted black, the walls are black, the ceiling is mostly black. Um, and so there's kind of, there's an absence of light in the space. And as the viewer's eyes adjust, they walk into the space and the only source of light is from above in the ceiling. Um, I had talked through this project when I was conceptualizing the piece with someone who worked in theater lighting design and kind of trying to think about how am I gonna draw the viewer's attention to the ceiling? And they pointed out, well, if you're you know, lighting a stage, a play on a stage in a theater, the way you draw the viewer's attention to something is to light it. You know, Say you spotlight a character and the whole rest of the stage is black. And so that got me thinking about how I could use lighting in this piece to draw the viewer's attention to the ceiling. So when the viewer looked up the ceiling, this is kind of like hard to explain with the images, but essentially they saw um, a series of kind of rectangular organic cut out shapes with torn edges that were illuminated from behind. So I essentially created um, a lattice-like structure made out of black tar paper, which I had torn um, into these different window-like shapes, if that makes sense. And then above this lattice uh, sort of lowered drop ceiling of, of sorts, um, I had manipulated elements of the ceiling. So I had painted different colors, um, uh, attached pieces of paper that were painted different colors to the ceiling, um, and essentially hid the lighting so that everything was illuminated above this black lattice of window-like shapes. Um, and some people, when they experienced this piece, told me that the effect was of stained glass. Like it was somewhat disorienting to some people as to what they were even looking at when they were looking up. Um, and I included a, two benches so that the viewer could sit and look up at the ceiling. Um, but that sense of like brightly illuminated color almost created this, this feeling of stained glass for some people. <clears throat> this piece was titled Estuary, um, which is the place where a river meets an ocean. And I was thinking about that place of the ground. Um, that the viewer would be standing on top of the ground and then they go underground through these stairs into the basement and then they look up at where their feet used to be. And there was something about that space between above ground and underground that 
I found really interesting. Um, and I related it to this idea of an estuary where salt water and fresh water are mixing. And it relates to my experience of place and my sense of identity in a way. Um, as someone who was born on Guam, I feel a really deep sense of connection to Guam, even though I really haven't lived there. Um, but I moved frequently as a kid. Um, my dad used to be in the Coast Guard. Um, and so we moved from Guam to uh, Florida, to Oahu, to Texas, to Alaska, back to Oahu, where I spent most of my teenage years, and then moved to Minnesota. And that sense of fluctuation, of movement, of never quite being grounded in one space, I think, I don't know, conjured something for me in my imagination as it relates to this idea of estuary, um, where the river meets the ocean. So now I wanna um, share with you kind of how my work evolved to this current piece that I created for the, um, the Reclaiming Identity show. Um, this piece is titled To My Guini. There's actually an A after the, or an I after the A-T-U-M-A-I-G-U-I-N-I. -I -I. I'm sorry for the misspelling, To My Guini. Um, and, uh, this word is a Chamorro word for the first month of the ancient Chamorro calendar, which is based on lunar cycles. Um, so going back to when I started taking um, Chamorro language classes, this was a really impactful experience for me. There was this curtain that was lifted in a really dramatic way. And I went from feeling like someone who was really isolated and alone in as someone from Guam to all of a sudden meeting um, Gisela McDaniel, the Chamorro figurative painter who is originally from Detroit um, and uh, Tina Delisle, who is this badass Chamorro scholar who works in American Indian, um, uh, department at the University of Minnesota, American Indian Studies, and Vince Diaz, who also is at the U and is the founder of the Native Canoe Program and is creating relationships between um, Pacific uh, outrigger canoe traditions and um, canoe traditions of the Dakota people in Minnesota. Um, and then discovering Julian Agon's poetry and writing uh, amazing uh, write, uh, environmental lawyer and activist and writer from Guam um, who wrote this book <laughs> um, that I uh, brought with me to strengthen my, um, or just give me a sense of confidence in this talk, No Country for Eight Spot Butterflies by Julian Agon. Um, what I'm trying to say is I realized like, oh, I'm not like the only Chamorro artist in the world. I'm part of this larger network of Chamorro scholars and thinkers and writers and artists and media producers. And that was amazing to feel this sense of connection <clears throat> with this larger network. Um, and in this piece, um, I wanted to play with the idea, the, the idea of like a visual representation of a calendar um, thinking about Tumaiguini, the first month of the Lunar New Year um, in the ancient Chamorro calendar, and thinking about time through the idea of cycles um, and circles, um, and the idea of temporality as something that is um, conceived of in relation to nature, the cycles of the moon. Um, and this was a, one of the first pieces where I started integrating this image of a hand into my work and starting to think about ways that I could bring in figuration into what was previously just kind of abstract paintings. Um, and this was a way for me to kind of be more, uh, uh, to reference more specifically like the body in relation to, um, in this case, a circle. And so 
in these uh, individual pieces, which are seen as a whole, there's a sense of movement and the hand making these playful shapes um, like shadows um, that are passing in front of this circle and kind of creating a dance like movement um, and a little bit evoking of, of like the different shapes that the moon makes throughout the lunar cycles. Here's a detail of one of the individual pieces. Um, I've worked a lot with earth, earth pigments and milk paint um, using casein um, for milk. And for some reason, I keep returning to this um, wrinkly texture in my work. And the last piece that I want to share with you is a recent installation that I created um, for an exhibition um, uh, called The Regional. I almost forgot the name of the exhibition, um, which Dakota's work was also included in. This, this exhibition featured um, artists in the Midwest region um, and was um, curated by Amara and Tia and Jade Powers. Um, of the Kemper Museum in Kansas City and the Cincinnati um, Contemporary Art Center. Um, and so this is an installation view where I was continuing to work with this hand image in relation to a circle. Here is a composite image that gives you a sense of the entire piece, um, which was located in the lobby of the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati. Um, and a little bit of my process. So here was um, uh, a preparatory sketch that I had created for the installation and mocking up the composition um, actually at a drawing studio at the University of Minnesota um, because my studio wasn't big enough. Um, this was the raw material that I had created with that same milk paint and uh, casein on paper, cutting out the individual shapes collaging them together and um, the piece was assembled um, in seven pieces. Um, and I was very pregnant when I created this piece um, and it was really challenging to create something large and also to ship something large that kind of required unique installation specifications. Um, I learned a lot with this project. Um, it was the first time that I had the opportunity to work with the support of a museum team. Um, and I was really grateful that they um, were super patient with me and super um, supportive of the entire process from beginning to end. And there was an interactive element of this artwork. So um, viewers would encounter the installation, which is kind of like a mural on the wall. Um, and then they were um, invited to take away this object which was a kind of viewfinder um, made with black paper cut into a circle with these holes, perforated holes cut into it. And if you can read the image on the right, that's the back side of the viewfinder, which offers an invitation slash instructions. Um, hold the viewfinder at arm's length, relax your eyes, look for light and color. And these are two photos that um, show you how I use this object. So um, I hold this object at arm's length and I look at the world through this object and it captures colors and light through these holes, which are also meant to evoke the stars in, in a way. And this brings me in a kind of cycle or circle um, to my earlier work. So when I was preparing this talk, I would, wanted to end with this image. Um, and I had this memory of this photograph that I had taken when I was installing this show. And it was really surprising to me. When I was installing this piece, um, uh, the blue one on the windows, um, which is made of actually basically garbage bags, plastic garbage bags that I had painted with this blue and black texture and then perforated holes in. 
it, I forgot until recently that I had been doing this in my work for quite some time, starting in grad school, perforating things with holes. And I remembered, oh yeah, when I was installing the piece, um, there was this one afternoon where it was really sunny out and the light was coming in through this installation sculptural painting. And I took this photograph um, when I was installing it. And this really pleases me. I love that this is an image that was in my camera roll on my phone, something that I had observed in my work. And it has that element of the hand, which really relates strongly to this piece, which I recently created. Um, and so I don't really have anything kind of um, resolved to share at the end of this talk, but I do have questions. I have questions right now about the figure and how representational imagery plays a role in my work. And I'm really questioning what that means um, and what I want to represent in my work and whether that relates to me and my body or my story. Um, I am also asking questions about tomorrow identity and language and whether that is a subject of my work um, and if so, how can I speak to that more clearly in my work as someone who works mostly in abstraction? Um, and, you know, for me, something that is a big barrier to me in terms of this idea of like reclaiming my Chamorro language, um, a barrier that I face right now is that I don't really have a community of Chamorro speakers in Minneapolis. All of my grandmother's siblings live on Guam. She, my grandmother lives on Oahu. Um, and I have very few younger people who are peers of mine who um, I can speak tomorrow with. And so that's something too that I'm kind of thinking about in my work is, um, uh, you know, like what stories do I want to share with my audience? And um, who is my audience as it relates to a Chamorro identity and Chamorro language. Um, so those are some of the questions that I'm asking myself now. And I um, invite you to ask me questions if you have any. And thank you so much for um, your time. And thank you to Dakota for giving me this opportunity to reflect on my work and share it in this, in this setting. Yes, thank you again, Isa, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I have many questions because I personally love your work, um, and I definitely, um, you know, would love to be able to ask them, but I'll have our audience kind of start submitting their questions, um, but I also kind of briefly want to kind of talk about you, um, you know, bringing this theme of this idea of reclaiming, which I think is kind of the big aspect of the, the theme of this exhibition is thinking about the various ways that this idea of reclaiming is always ongoing. Um, mm -hmm. There is not this idea of indigenous people being static or monolithic. So to be able to really appreciate um, your process as an artist and thinking of it, um, I think you directly said the process of fragmentation, I think is really special um, when it comes to your work. And um, you know, some questions that your audience had uh, the first one would be, you know, why do you work with paper and make it appear fabric-like rather than working with fabric itself? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> why do I work with paper and make it fabric-like, but then why not just use fabric in my work? Um, one of the reasons why I'm drawn to paper is because... Um, it feels, it has a presence that feels like it can be torn or it can be um, dissolved, not necessarily dissolved, but there's something about it that's um, fragile. Um, and fragile and something that could be cut up and turned into something else or um, that's, uh, mutable, um, that's not permanent. And I think that's why I'm interested in shaped artworks too, that aren't sort of like rectangles, if that makes sense. Um, 
because I feel like it's something that I can, like for example, with the first newsprint work that I made, the colorful one that was made with tissue paper, um, I tore it up into different pieces and transformed them into other works. So there's something about that process that interests me about paper. Um, uh, regarding fabric, um, those that first installation that I created did include silk pieces. And I am interested in exploring fabric in future works. But for lack of a better reason, I'm really drawn to paper. It's a material that has a certain presence that speaks to me, that resonates with me, that I feel comfortable using and manipulating. Um, and for whatever reason, fabric uh, doesn't resonate with me as strongly right now. Yeah, thank you for that, Isa. Um, and I'd also like to add, especially when you're talking about your materials, um, you know, being coming from the community of, um, you know, especially thinking of Chamorro identity, uh, paper being a big part of that, um, especially with the history of bark and the way that that's woven, mm -hmm. created. Mm -hmm. um, not to imply that's part of your process, but I think that's something really kind of beautiful to bring out is thinking about our genetic memory and connected to the materials that we use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do wonder if my ancestors were weavers and if they weaved with uh, pandas leaves mm -hmm. and other, um, or, you know, before, uh, modernization of architecture in Guam, uh, you know, a family home would be thatched, would have a thatched roof made with coconut leaves. Um, and I think that dried leaves and other plant materials that are used in weaving and architecture in Guam and other areas of the Mariana Islands, um, they have like a paper-like quality. Mm -hmm. So I can't help but imagine that there's something that kind of resonates with me about that texture. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, so in the second question, uh, do you intend to use the hand in positions that make it appear as a wave? So specifically in the Cincinnati installation piece, the hands together appear as a wave. Yes, that was intentional to um, create um, a shape that was ascending, um, that evoked to the wave. And um, you can kind of see through this, this gap between the two walls, there's concrete in the back. Um, the Contemporary Art Center, which was designed by Zaha Hadid, um, has this really distinct curved concrete wall. And um, that was uh, something that inspired me when I was developing the piece because it reminded me of a wave. Um, and so that kind of led me to wanting to create this shape that had a wave-like form um, um, in it. And I think, you know, the hand can make beautiful curves too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's also kind of jumps into a question that I have as well, uh, because so much of your process talks about these, um, you know, pieces made in response to the sites that you're creating them. And I, you know, especially being kind of curious about whether you are open to exploring this idea of place, um, and especially kind of thinking about memory and the way that, um, you know, kind of thinking about this, this idea of, you know, what does it mean to reclaim these spaces? Um, so if you can talk a little bit more about that. Yes, I think that the work that I've done in site responsive installation has primarily been in um, uh, sort of conventional gallery spaces or institutions, if that makes sense. So like the quarter gallery was in the institution of the University of Minnesota. Um, this is in the Contemporary Art Center. So there's certain like conventions of space um, that kind of have political implications to them. Um, in other words, like I'm kind of interested in how my work functions in relation to institutions of power. Um, but I don't really have like concrete answers to that. I, it's like something that I'm like, uh, that seems like uh, a question that I should investigate more deeply. But then I'm thinking about landscape, right? I'm talking about waves or the lunar cycles. So then that seems to, to 
to ask my work, like, do you actually really want to be in these spaces or does my work want to be somewhere else? Mm -hmm. I feel like my work is trying to tell me that it, it needs to be somewhere new. And so that is something that um, I'm kind of calling on the universe for is like, what would it look like if I had, um, for example, like a residency where I could create an artwork in a space? And what if that space was completely different than a traditional gallery, for mm -hmm. example? What if it was outdoors? Um, and then that leads me to these other questions of like, is my work in good relationship to the spaces that I live in now? Like, is my work in good relationship to the indigenous people of Minnesota Makoche, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and what does that look like if my work is in dialogue with spaces outside of the institution, the dominant institutions? Um, and so that's where someone like Vince Diaz is really inspiring to me at the University of Minnesota because he's like building like Micronesian canoes and sailing them on the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm in community with people who are indigenous to Minnesota. And that just blows my mind mm -hmm. that he's bridging these worlds between Oceania and uh, people in this region. Um, so I hope that is okay to give a messy answer. No, to your that's question. totally fine. <laughs> Especially as artists, you know, I think that's something really important is to kind of hear a little bit about our in process and the way that we're thinking. Um, and especially, you know, talking about future collaborations, that would just be something really exciting to see in the future. Um, you know, seeing your work existing outside of these institutions and, um, and especially kind of building that sense of community, which is such a big part of Indigenous, for Indigenous people. Mm. Um, and to kind of jump into the next question, especially as we're talking about the waves, um, we have a um, audience member ask, you mentioned this wavy surface texture that you've continued to continuing to revisit. Um, how are you thinking about it now in your work? And also how has that changed over the years? It's like something that, um... I don't think about super consciously. Um, I think I'm drawn to certain textures um, on an intuitive level. Um, and I think there's something about um, the textures that I create that um, I guess emphasize the tactility of the material and emphasize um, the, the like kind of objectness of the work. So in other words, that it's um, it has a presence as a thing, <laughs> um, as opposed to a, a image that's representing an idea of a thing. Um, so I want the viewer to feel like, oh, I feel like I can touch it, even if they aren't touching it. I feel like a sense of tactility. Tactility feels really important to me for some reason. And I think that's why I'm drawn to the silhouette of a hand because it suggests that element of touch. Um, and this might be too where uh, my work at teaching drawing really impacts my uh, the materials that I'm drawn to because I feel like drawing from direct observation is, is as much as, uh, it's as much about what you see as that feeling of the the pressure of placing a pencil on paper and the kind of way that you feel what you see through a very tactile process of drawing. Um, so there's something there. There's like something about the way that I uh, visually experience the world is very connected to my sense of touch mm -hmm. um, and the haptic, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's something um, that we kind of briefly talked about before we began the talk was our experiences of our ancestors and what they used to um, utilize and especially weaving. And there's something really amazing about this idea of work that you're able to touch, um, which almost is completely absent in galleries or, you know, larger museum institutions where we don't get to engage with the work in that way, um, you know, which kind of jumps into uh, which will probably be the last question for your talk, um, which, you know, I kind of notice when you're talking about your work that you created for Reclaiming Identity, you brought up this idea of the politics of beauty, 
um, and how that's kind of been fetishized or romanticized. And I would love to hear a little bit more about, you know, how can we as artists really directly challenge this idea, um, but also have our audience understand kind of the different indigenous ways of thinking or creating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when I was in grad school during my um, uh, first year candidacy review, which was like kind of like an oral defense of my work in an academic context, um, one of my uh, 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 mentors asked me, um, like, how does beauty function in your work? And uh, it really threw me off guard. And it's one of those questions that's been like a thorn in my side ever since, you know, and at the time I tried to give a really heady response to this question. I was like, well, I haven't read Elaine Scarry's On Beauty, so I don't really know, like I haven't read enough and I'm not really sure. And, you know, they were like, yeah, all that aside, like, can you just speak in your own authentic voice about how beauty functions in your work? And, um, it's been this unanswerable question for me, but I think it's an important one, especially coming from a Chamorro context, a context in Guam, a context in Oceania. Um, you know, when I went to art school, uh, who were the artists that I learned about that were in Oceania? It was Gauguin painting women in French Polynesia, right, in Tahiti. And it wasn't looking at Tahitian women artists, it was looking at, um, uh, you know, like a, a, a fetishizing of the beauty of the islands um, through a kind of like sexist or like consumerist kind of violent kind of lens. Um, and so I do think that there's something about how beauty functions in my work that has to do with um, maybe resilience. Um, in the face of that kind of um, violence. Um, and I think about someone like Gisela McDaniel, who is a figurative painter. And what I think is really interesting about beauty in her work is that she makes figurative paintings um, and does paintings from direct observation of the people that she paints portraits of um, who are women or femme people. Um, and she interviews them while she paints them and then the audio recordings of their stories are played alongside the paintings in when they're presented and so as an audience member you see this very visually appealing and beautiful um painting of this person and you hear their voice telling their story. And so there's something about that where she's kind of interrupting the kind of visual vocabulary of how like women from the Pacific Islands have been um, uh, objectified through visual art. Um, and, and then someone like Julian Agon, who is using beauty to compel the reader to be quiet and to lean in and to pause um, amidst the kind of noise of uh, crisis, of climate crisis, because he's really talking about how um, places like Guam, these really vulnerable small islands, are the places that have the least amount of um, self-determination and agency, but they're the most impacted by climate change. But then he's talking about like an eight-spot butterfly, like a tiny little butterfly. Um, so I'm paying attention to artists and writers like them and trying to understand how beauty functions in their work. And I think that beauty is something that I have the responsibility to articulate more about. And it's something that is, um, it's an area of my work that I want to focus on and to be able to articulate and explore in a deeper way. Yeah, thank you for that answer, Yusa. Um, and again, thank you so much for giving us not only a wonderful presentation, but just to be able to, um, you know, us as audience members kind of pick your brain, you know, about your process and, you know, through your intention with your work. And I think it's, 
amazing to see the progression from what you presented in terms of your, your abstractions and then kind of formulating those ideas even further. Um, so again, thank you so much for that. And thank you again as well to our audience for joining us today um, and especially to the Trout Museum of Art for organizing this event. And I highly recommend that all of you check out the work from the other 24 artists in this exhibition. Um, and especially if you are interested in learning more about the exhibition or any upcoming events, uh, feel free to visit their website at troutmuseum.org. Um, and again, I hope all of you have a wonderful afternoon and thanks for joining us today. Thank you.